Welcome to All Things Book Fair. I'm Stephanie St. Cole. Founded by Miami-Dade College and community partners, the 36th Miami Book Fair is an eighth-day literary party with more than 450 authors from the United States and around the world. This year's event begins on Sunday, November 17, and ends with a weekend street fair extravaganza beginning on Friday, November 22nd, until Sunday, November 24th. There are events for the entire family and for all ages. This television program will highlight some of the many authors presenting their work at this year's event. My first guest is presenting his new book, The Girl in the Glass Box, a Jack Switek novel, a book whose central issue is the immigration debate in the U.S. Joining me is award-winning author James Gripando. Glad to be here. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure. So let's get right into it. Yeah. How did your background as a lawyer help you become an author? So I was, uh, this goes way back, more than 25 years. Um, and my goal in life was always to be a lawyer, uh, but my dream was to be a writer. Um, I had no idea how much the two interlapped. You really do have to be a good writer to be an effective lawyer. But I never really thought that that being a lawyer would translate to being um, an author. But then all of a sudden, I saw shows like Law and Order coming on and becoming hugely successful, and authors like John Grisham were getting traction. And so I gave it a shot. And um, I think the natural transition here is storytelling. As a trial lawyer, you really are telling a story in a compressed period of time to an audience, your jurors, and um, hoping that they don't go to sleep <laughs> in the process, right? So you have to keep it somewhat lively and entertaining and understandable. And all of those things translate, I think, very well into becoming a novelist where um, you might do a ton of research on something that only produces one little sentence that makes it into a book. You have to be able to keep the story moving in the same way that you have to have your case being persuasive to a jury. So um, I think there's a lot of overlap in that regard. And, um, and over the past 25 years, um, that I've just kind sort of honed my skills in that regard. I see that, I see that, because you gotta keep the page turning and... You do, you know, and, and that's important. Uh, and I think being a self-editor is really important to being both a lawyer and, or, and an author. I mean, as a, as a lawyer, oftentimes, um, you know, you think there's absolutely no way I can present this case. But what about as, a, as a writer? Yeah. You've written many novels whose central theme is the law. Um, and crime and social issues. Why do you think it's important to write about these topics in nonfiction? So I, I think it's because otherwise, in, in the world of nonfiction, mm -hmm. it, it can become information. In the world of fiction, um, especially, I mean, The Girl in the Glass Box is a good example. Um, and this is, immigration is an issue that is hugely, hugely debated right now. Um, and uh, Jack Switek helps a woman who is fleeing gang violence in El Salvador and uh, seeks asylum in the United States. Now, we all see the news about that, but to be able to actually understand what a lawyer goes through representing a, cl a client who's in that desperate situation, you get into the emotions of it and understand that it's about um, family, she's trying to save her daughter, it's about personal safety, she's fleeing gang violence, and it's also about the law because we have a system that is sort of broken and Jack tries to navigate his way through there as best he can for his client. Um, basically I have a final thought for you and I really want to know, Jack Switek. Tell me, is he, 
Are you him? Or? So, yeah, yeah, I get that. I ask that a lot because, you know, Jack uh, started in 1994 with the pardon. Uh, and he's evolved. He was a single, um, unmarried guy like I was when I created him, and now he's a family man like I am. So in, in, in the sense that he has evolved over time, yes, he is me. But, um, and I would like to think that also in the sense that Jack tries to do the right thing, that that's sort of autobiographical. Um, but there are aspects to Jack that are completely um, unlike me and that, um, y you know, you, you, you have certain, um, certain uh, relationships in his life that sort of, like he has a very tumultuous relationship with his father. Ah. My father and I were best friends. Okay, so, so there are a few things. So yeah, so you can't really say, okay, that he's writing about himself, but definitely there is... A, a core there that is similar. Well, James Gurgando, thank you so much for joining us here in All Things Book Fair. It was a pleasure. See you at the book fair. And we're gonna be taking a brief break and next we're going to dabble into a mystery novel and how a saint is a theme of this new book. Stay tuned. You're watching MDC TV. Welcome back to All Things Book Fair. I'm Stephanie St. Cole. The Miracle of St. Lazarus, a mystery 20 years in the making, is a mystery novel of a mother who never gave up hope finding her daughter more than 23 years after she went missing. Dr. Uva de Aragon, its award-winning author joins me now. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being with us. I want to start with, why Hurricane Andrew? Why start there? Well, uh, it was a difficult time for Miami, uh, uh, and this is a cold case that the detective gets, and he needed to be old, so um, that um, gave me a, a starting point of uh, something that a lot of people uh, in Florida relate to an important event. Part of the Cuban folklore is St. Lazarus and the, the patron saint of the poor and sick. Why St. Lazarus? Why not using the Virgin of Charity? Well, um, in part because the Virgin of Charity is very more used in Cuban literature than St. Lazarus. And mainly, really, because part of the story takes place in Hialeah, and if you go to Hialeah, there are a lot of statues of San Lazarus, and there's a lot called to San Lazarus. There's a church there, so actually, it, it was it came naturally into the story that the grandmother, mother of the lost child, um, believes that San Lazarus can make a miracle for her. I noticed that um, you wrote the book initially in Spanish, and yes. then you translated it to English. No, I write in Spanish. Um, I came to the United States when I was 15, and for a few years I wrote in English, but then I saw a very close relationship to being Cuban and writing in Spanish. And I come from a family of writers on my mother's side, and I wanted to be part of Cuban literature. Uh, so I write in Spanish, and I have been fortunate that a translator, um, a professor, Jeffrey Barnett, uh, was interested in my previous novel and translated, and now he and his wife translated this. Um, but I, I write in Spanish. Does your Cuban heritage intermingle with your writing as far as the content? Very, very much so. Um, I, I um, lived in the United States when I was 15. That means 60 years ago. I was 75 years this summer. And um, many of my stories take place in the United States. and. But uh, my Cuban culture, heritage, is, is definitely a, 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 an essential part of my work. Your background in education as former associate director of the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University um, helped you become a writer? No, I think it's the other way around. I think the fact that I was a writer helped me get that job. Ah. I've been writing since I'm nine and publishing since I was very young. And uh, it was difficult to, as an exile, uh, having to make a living um, to 
keep writing, but uh, I was just born a writer and I had to write. I would write even if there weren't readers. Um, so I think that um, certain prominence as, a, as an author and, and as an author of Cuban themes um, helped me in my job. And, and yes, every experience I had in my job, I, was, I returned to Cuba and knowing Cuba uh, firsthand helped me enrich my work. But I don't think that you know, uh, it helped me be a writer. I was already a writer. Very quickly before we go, what's the goal of your book? Well, I don't think you write books with a goal, but if it would have one, uh, the character Maria Duquesnes is a female about the age of my daughters. Um, my previous novel, the characters were about my age, so this is about second generation Cuban American women. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's a kaleidoscope view uh, of the differences, uh, the multicultural Miami, and uh, but yet has a lot of common. Uh, there's a g girl from Haiti, there's an old woman that went from Poland, there's an uh, exile from Spain. So fresh perspective. So it, it's Different a perspective, perspective of the multicultural world that Miami is. It's a very rooted uh, South Florida novel. And everything that's local is also universal because that's what the world is, very I multicultural. I completely agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Uva de Aragon. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And there you have it. Thanks for watching All Things Book Fair. I'm Stephanie St. Combe, and we'll be right back. You're watching MDC TV. Welcome back to All Things Book Fair. I'm Stephanie St. Combe. Festival of Dangerous Ideas, a collection of poems that conjures the nightmare world of what could be in the not too distant future, dives into love, family, art, and politics with a bright flame lit by the imagination. Its author is award-winning poet Lenny De La Rocca, who's joining me now. Thank you for coming, Lenny De La Rocca. Nice Thanks for having me. Here. I want to know why a poetry book to talk about a terrifying world in the future. It didn't start that way. Um, originally the book was called Fables just as a placeholder kind of a title because I had been writing all of these sort of uh, fairy tale fable kinds of prose poems and some of them or many of them were kind of dark in nature. I, my imagination takes flight um, but the more I thought about it and the more as I was writing the poems and working on them uh, it became clear that this was heading in a little bit different direction than just fables or fairy tales. And one day I was on my way to work and I was heading down 95, I was listening to NB NPR, and there was a, some kind of a thing about something called the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, which is a real festival that takes place once a year in Australia. Mm -hmm. And it's all these folks from around the world, uh, cultural people, political people, etc., academics, and they meet and they talk about uh, I guess dangerous ideas, but when I heard the festival of dangerous dangerous ideas, I thought that's got to be the name of the book, mm -hmm. you know. So I changed it from fables to uh, festival of dangerous ideas. And so in the po in the book, there's poems that are political, have a political slant. And there's poems that go back to my family life. There's poems that go into all different mm -hmm. directions. Um, because the intention of the book is for us to take a look at the near future in politics um, in a terrifying way. Do you think that we're currently looking at something like that? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I started this book, the, the, most of these poems were written prior to the 2016 election. So I really didn't know that, you know, what was coming and how, uh, how much some of these poems really spoke to that. To, the, to what happened. Um, and so, yeah, I think that the, the uh, political nature of what's going on in the country and the world, really, uh, I think we've, we've reached it. It's, it's, it's here. You've written several poem books. How did you prepare to put all of this into one cohesive book? Well, 
I, I have four books out, and um, I don't necessarily start by writing a book of poems. Uh, I was writing the poems individually, and then after a while you start to see there's a sort of a theme maybe, or a, they kind of relate to one another somehow. And then you start gathering them up and you decide, okay, maybe this could be a collection. And then after you decide that these could be a collection, then I started writing poems for that collection. But it didn't start that way. At, at first, they were just these poems. And so then I started writing for that. And then once I decided to call it the festival, you know, Festival of Dangerous Ideas, I didn't have a poem called Festival of Dangerous Ideas. Not that I had to, uh, but then I wrote one. And the idea was, um, the, the poem itself, Festival Dangerous Isaiah, is about a child uh, who stumbles across this, uh, comes through this gate, and he enters this, this place that wasn't there the day before. It's like a magical place, on, you know. <clears throat> and, um, and then he walks through, which is this festival, uh, and comes to this theater and then goes inside. And so the book is sort of like this fantastic uh, show of, 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 you know, image after image, poem after poem, of him going through this, or her, going through this festival, mm -hmm. which is kind of uh, macabre and dark in nature most of the time. Lenny De La Roca, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And there you have it. That was Lenny De La Roca in All Things Book Fair. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. You're watching MDC TV. Hello, and welcome back to All Things Book Fair. I'm Stephanie St. Colm. We know how bad traffic has gotten in South Florida. The book titled, Making Good Time, True Stories of How We Do and Don't Get Around in South Florida, is a compendium of many positive and not so positive stories while riding along the many roads of South Florida. I'm joined by its editor, Lynn Barrett, professor at Florida International University. Glad to be here. Thank you. How did this book come about? Were you stuck in traffic? Well, I've been many times stuck in traffic for various reasons, um, and I certainly I've been here for more than 30 years, have noticed uh, change. And I find that I really notice change or mark change over time by a certain place. So I began because I was uh, sitting at uh, Biscayne and 79th Street, where I'd been stuck many times for many reasons. And I also know a lot about the history. So it's also known to me as a crossroads between the beach going across that way, the beach, over to the racetrack versus north-south on Biscayne. But there have been protests there, accidents there, all kinds of things there that gave me a kind of time to sit still and think and remember the previous times. So I started to think about how many other stories people had told me that involved different places but often involved the difficulty of getting around, the need to get around, ways of getting around, um, and how place-driven they were, that there was a certain kind of place-driven storytelling, which could start maybe as a complaint, but often turned funny, um, or turned into a survival tale, or something like that. And um, I myself am a fiction writer and have edited other things, so I thought there could just be, as you said, a compendium of different stories uh, from this place that would then stimulate more storytelling. And the contributors in your book, how did you select them and how are they connected to South Florida? They all have either live or have lived in South Florida. Many people I've taught, I taught at FIU, I've worked with people at FIU, I know people at the other, have gone through the other schools. Some of the people, however, I'd never met. Once I approached Highlight Books with my book proposal and they agreed to go forward, they also, and I wanted this, they knew other people I'd never met. So some of the people I still haven't met, but I've, we, were, we corresponded about their pieces by email and I'm gonna get to meet some of them now with the book out. And the, we were looking for people who'd written about transportation in South Florida, potentially as journalists, people who'd had it as their profession, people who just experienced it, people who grew up here, people who came from elsewhere and then had to encounter it at different points in time, just to have a big variety. And in the, also I wanted to cover a lot of territory, so the, the stories stretch from down in the Keys on up beyond Broward, sort of into the, the turnpike heading north. Um, and they are not just 
uh, car oriented. There's trains, planes, <laughs> skateboards, all kinds of ways of getting around. You're covering it all. I want to know how did we get this bad? Some of that, the book has uh, some pieces early on mm -hmm. um, that are in a section called Time Travels that are looking at now but also going back and remembering. And of course it happened bit by bit and this is a place that where we celebrate in certain ways the, the opening up of South Florida from Henry Flagler's Railroad uh, which went all the way down to the Keys and it's a big place for the history of aviation. Um, it's where Glenn Curtis, uh, who's an innovator in plane engines and other things, um, had people flying, uh, filming stunts from airplanes in 1920s silent movies, things like that. There was a blimp field. So there was a sense of it's wide open, we can do anything, only it's not so wide open anymore because more and more people came. And it's also not controlled by one planning anything. There's lots of bits and pieces, many, many different municipalities, counties, everything influencing each other. So there's a lot of reasons that it's the way it is now. I mean, everyone wants to move here, right? So. And some people le want to leave. I mean, there are there's a, a, a bit of that represented in the book because I, you know, wanted to be to be honest. Also, people will relocate themselves geographically within South Florida mm -hmm. because of the nature of their work. Or you can see some of this in the book. There's some things that are about raising children and wanting to be somewhere that's more walkable, for instance. Um, so. It constructs our lives in a lot of ways without us necessarily having, we can complain again, but we're not really having a conversation about it. This is the first of a Miami trilogy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the next two books will be about? Yes, I'm not going to be the editor of those, but again, Highlight Books decided that um, the, the idea of creative written work that is then aimed at a problem facing South Florida and Miami specifically would lead to two more. So the next one will be about sea level rise and the third one will be about poverty. Wow. And uh, as I often say, we can't talk just about poverty. You have to talk about poverty in relation to wealth, the things that are constructing, even the differences in where people are living is part of the transportation. So the, all these things connect back and forth to each other. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. You're gonna stick around and we'll be right back and we're going to speak with two other of the contributors of Making Good Time. Stay tuned. You're watching MDC TV. Welcome back. I'm Stephanie St. Combe, and here we're talking about the new book, Making Good Time, true stories of how we do and don't get around in South Florida. We have here with us Jan Becker, a writer and writing professor, Louis K. Lowey, a former firefighter and also a writer, two of the 32 contributors to the book, and from our previous segment, Lynn Barrett, professor at FIU and editor of the book. So let's begin with telling us why did you get involved in this project? Um, well, for me, Lynn contacted me because my, my story started with a Facebook post. So mm. she saw my Facebook post and said, I think that would be a good story. Could you write it up? Oh. So that's how I got involved. And for you, Liz? Uh Basically, Lynn Barrett. That's the reason. Um, she contacted me and explained about the project. And I was like, well, what the heck am I going to do? She said. You're a firefighter. You're in a fire engine. You're fire I said, oh, man, that, that's, she's right. <laughs> yeah. Not get into too much detail, but Jen, can you tell us a little bit about your horror story? Um, sure. I, uh, mine took place two years ago, and in February, I was traveling. At, at that time, I was working two jobs and living in Pompano Beach, so my commute was like 500 miles a week plus. Um, and my car broke down in a really bad spot in between. It was on, the, it was on an on-ramp between I-95 North and the Turnpike. And it was a spot where re rescue, rescue crews wouldn't come just after rush hour when the sun was setting. Um, and my lights went out. Wow. Um, so I didn't have any hazard lights. And I was broken down in the fast lane at a spot where there was no shoulder on the road. Wow. Can we 
for a minute, I wanted to switch perspectives because Liz, you, were, you mentioned you were a firefighter. Can you tell us how has it been since you've been working, like when you were working as a firefighter, I know that they have some emergency lights that they tell people that they have to slow down. Is it better now? Is it worse? What would you say? I would say, honestly, it's probably about the same. You're dealing with drivers and, and they have various reactions when the, when the engines and the pumpers and the uh, ladder trucks come through. Some of them panic. Some of them zip ahead. Some of them want to trail you like you're the locomotive. And um, others are pretty courteous and pull, pull to the side. The, the key is while you're driving is just to be aware that any one of those reactions can happen. And to In some of your stories, you talk about your experiences, uh, pretty traumatic experiences about young people losing their lives. And um, what I want to know is, do you think people will really understand from the stories that you wrote, what is it that you go through as a firefighter or EMT personnel? I think that people in general get an idea of what's going on. I mean, it's, most people are appreciative when you tell them you're a firefighter, so they understand, but intimate? Um, no, it's just something you have to live through to truly understand it. I think you can give them a taste of it. Lynn, do you think everyone in South Florida has stories like these? I think everyone is abounding in stories to tell about um, the lots of different experiences. There's many forms of transportation and transit and everything here. The cover sort of shows that. And people will have both been um, in situations walking, driving, biking, flying, boating. And there's a kind of competition among those modes. When I first moved here, I was living on Bay Harbor Islands and I would be stuck because the bridge was up that was like the Kane Causeway Bridge to get to let boats through. And there's this kind of who gets precedence. I had come from a, a, a cold and windy city, and so I was, I'm just lucky to be stuck here looking at you know, this beautiful thing. I don't mind being stuck. But the fact is, I've never been the person on the boat who might perceive it very differently. But one of the pieces in the book talks about being the person on the boat and looking at it from that perspective. So once you do that and you start opening up perspectives, I think what happens is everyone's like, well, here, I've, I've got this experience that you don't know about. And once we talk, we get connected to each other. So you're forming community by storytelling, which is very ancient, but totally possible now. Jan, you also talk about avoiding items on the road. Yeah, yeah. They're, I've seen lately the digital signs on the highway. They've, they've switched them occasionally to secure your load. And I've dodged huge metal trash cans, industrial size like submarine propellers, I dodged a baby grand piano one time. What? A load of palm trees, all all kinds of things fall off the back of trucks. So I'm I'm I've become very good at dodging things. Wow. I have a question for all of you before we close today. What final advice would you give those who drive around in South Florida? Slow down would be one thing. Like try to pace yourself and not be impatient because I think a lot of things go wrong because people become reasonably, with good reason to be impatient, but they become impatient or frantic or desperate, and often that's where trouble happens. Um, so some of it is planning ahead, trying to understand that everyone else is not your competitor, but that you're all in basically a very complex, cooperative game to get every, for everyone to get from one place to another. I, I highly recommend telecommuting and working from home <laughs> so that you don't have to drive the highways at all. And Honestly, what works best for me is whatever time I think I, should, I need to leave, I add about 15% to that. And that way, I don't worry about traffic. I don't worry about anything. It's a relaxing drive. Thank you so much, Louis Lowey, Jan Becker, Lynn Barrett. It's been a pleasure. Remember that the 36th Miami Book Fair begins on Sunday, November 17th, and ends with a weekend street fair extravaganza beginning on Friday, November 22nd, until Sunday, November 24th. This is an event for the entire family. Abolitionist and social reformer Frederick Douglass once said, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. So, be free by reading a book, because the more you read, the more you learn. I'm Stephanie St. Combe. 
Until next time, have a great day.